try to keep you safely in between the lines I try to put you in the box that I've designed I try to pull you down so we are eye to eye When did I forget that you've all We're going to be in Psalms, Psalms 91. I'll make a deal with you. If the power goes out, we'll just keep going. I'll use a light from my phone, and you just sit there in the dark, and uh, we'll finish up, and we'll make up something for the video when we go to post it. So uh, if you can turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 91. And we're going to be verses, verse 2 mostly, but we're going to look at verse 1. We're also going to look at some more around it. We'll have them on the screen. If you have your Bibles, that's great. You need to be staying in your Word, but um, if you can, and if you will, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. Let's pray. Father, we pray, Lord, that the truth of your word penetrate our hearts so that when we need it, we need it every day, but we need this most when troubles arise, when the storms are there. We pray, God, that this be brought back to our minds. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a psalm for those who walk with God. This is a psalm where you, you don't just have, it's more than a religious profession. It's the relationship part. And I know we say that a lot. It's become cliche, but it still doesn't change the fact that it's true. Faith has fixed their hearts on God. 
If an individual can grasp verse 1, then verse 2 begins to be real to them. But I was reading a quote. The quote said, Only those who know the love of God in Christ Jesus come into the secret place of the Most High to those who dwell there. And he quoted Philippians 1.21 where he said, To live is Christ and to die is gain. Now this was Charles Spurgeon who said that. And I began to wonder, you know, how does... How do we measure up to his conclusion? But then I took it a step further and I began to wonder, how did he measure up to that conclusion? Did his life hold up to it? Well, in verse 1 you saw where it talks about the shadow, being in the shadow of the Almighty. And what that does is it paints a picture, kind of like a mama with her little child. You know, if you ever see how a little, a little one's always up under mama. And they're in the shadow of mama. It's also in verse 4 where you see this laid out where he will cover you with his feathers. Given the idea, taking refuge under his wing like a bird with her little babies. And protecting them, sheltering them. This is the imagery that the psalmist is putting for us here. Now, what kind of words come out of an individual when they are in the shadow of God, the Father? Well, you see some examples in your Bible. And there's places in your Bible where they're going to say, but especially verse 2, where he says that it's like a refuge. It's like a fortress. And he talks about trusting God. And those are the areas we're going to pull out of this. The first part of this, I will say concerning the Lord, who is my refuge. Now, this refuge, there in verse 2, the refuge is laid out there for us, for this hiding place. Every which way, the two different ways we're looking at this, describe two different ways of protection, if that makes sense. Refuge here is kind of like being, like a storm shelter. The other day I was driving past and I noticed uh, out there at Yellow Creek, they got a sign up that says the storm shelter is that way. If you live somewhere where you don't feel safe, it's good to know when a tornado is coming, when a storm is coming, you've got a place to go for safety. These places have been provided for the citizens of the communities that they live in so that they can go to those places. A lot of times a church during a storm will have an area. I don't recommend you do it here because this is a metal building. I don't want to be in it, but if you want to, go ahead. Back there might be the safest spot. But some churches have a basement, and in that community, they'll say, come, you can use our basement. But it's always a refuge from the storm. Speaking of storms. And when you're a refuge from the storm, I couldn't ask for better special effects while we're doing this. Refuge from the storm is what God is giving. He is a place to hide when the storms assail us. When they come after us. So we have a safe place to go. He, he is a place. He himself is that place. Now... Not only that, it's when other people, it's a place to hide when other people do bad. A shelter, I was, Corey Ten Boone, when the, her book, The Hiding Place, we were talking about this last night, where when the Nazis came after the Jews, they hid Jews in their homes, they built a, a wall so that they could hide behind it. There's a fake wall that looked like it was the regular wall, and it was a shelter, it was a place when the government was coming against those citizens of that nation and the, the, the atrocities that were happening. So there's always that imagery of a shelter, a place to go to be safe when you're being attacked. When you're being attacked by the storms that are out of your control and when you're being attacked by other individuals. It's all laid out there for us. Is The consequences of people's bad decisions, the people who betray us, people who want to do you harm. The imagery here is that with God, you have a place that you can go. Now, when you have a storm shelter and you go into it, the storm doesn't cease because you went into the storm shelter. When you go hide from the Nazis, the Nazis don't stop looking for you just because you're hiding. What I'm saying is, when he said there that God is my refuge, don't get the idea, Christian, that the storm still does not rage. 
Don't get the idea that there's not people going to try to do harm. But when the storms still come, and when people still fail us, we have verse 15 in the text. When he calls out to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and give him honor. Now, so even when the bad stuff happens, we still give honor. Even when we don't feel like... the like We get this idea in Christianity that as long as I am with God, nothing bad can ever happen to me. And that's a, that's, it's a false representation of what God does and who God is. Now, how often does the psalmist run away to this refuge? Well, we see it, and I'll give you a few examples. In Psalms 46, verse 1 and verse 7, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a helper, a helper, who is always found in times of trouble. So when the trouble comes, He gives help. Verse 7, the Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Okay? Psalm 62, 8. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before Him. God is our refuge. Again, the imagery of you being safe in this place. 71, 7 of Psalms. Ah. Uh, am like a miraculous sign to many, and you are my strong refuge. Here again, the imagery. And you know what? It, it's just a theme throughout the entire book. It just keeps flowing through because you got David who's running for his life from Saul. You've got all these issues in life that come up. Now, when the storms do come, if you are the one who's trusting in God, you got a place to hide you got a place to go. But if you're not trusting in God, then you don't have a place where you can go to if you don't have that kind of relationship. And that's what I was talking about, the relationship. It's not the religion. You can have the religion, but the religion is not going to shelter you in the time of storm. The relationship, knowing Him, having an intimate time with God, allows you to understand... I can trust Him. I can rely upon Him. I can go to Him in the times of storms. I can go to Him when things are happening to me that I don't care for. Now, I talked about Spurgeon. Spurgeon, did he really live it out in his life? And I read his biography, and in his biography, this man struggled with depression. A lot of people don't know that. That the depression was so strong with him that there were times he would be sitting at his seat in his chair and he just felt this heavy burden pressing upon him. And to my knowledge, he lived his life that way. More than not, he had to take sabbaticals, he had to get away because he was always under depression. And it never went away. He just dealt with it. Another thing he dealt with was physical. Because y'all know... Physical ailment will affect you spiritually. And when you got physical ailments, he had gout. And anybody that's ever had gout knows how painful that is. And apparently he had it real bad. And he hurt and he hurt and he hurt. But in spite of his emotional struggles, in spite of his physical struggles, he leaned on Psalm 91. So yeah, I would say when he said what he said about a person... Finding this in Christ, they understood that the refuge being in Jesus, then we can make it through whatever we go through. And one of the biggest things people go through today, you know, mental illness, depression, and all that stuff, and physical ailments. So yeah, he found, but did it go away? No, it didn't go away. But what happened was, he made a way through those things with the help of the Father and knowing that he had a shelter to go through. You might come out of storm shelter and your house is gone, man. You know? You might come out of storm shelter and your neighborhood has been wiped out. But the God who shelters you is the God who restores you and the God who cares about you. I just don't want you to get the idea that God takes away all your problems. He also said He is my fortress in verse 2. 
All right. <clears throat> God provides a place of safety for times of battle. Battle. So, especially when David was um, running and everything, God gave him a place to go. Here we have protection. Here we have when the battle's going on. Salvation doesn't mean you won't have conflict with your spiritual enemy. Every Christian is at war. Every Christian is in a battle. We've been talking about this. If you don't buy into it, you're not looking around. You're not understanding the spiritual life as a Christian and understanding that you will be attacked and the enemy will come after you. God's not sheltering you from the attack. God's giving you a place to go. He's giving you a fortress. And the beautiful thing about it is the fortress is within Himself. He is your fortress. That's why I'm saying if you've got no relationship with God, and I don't mean saved, which that's a big key. If you're not saved, then you don't have any of these, these um, wonderful benefits of the Christian faith. But if you're not in, even if you are saved and you're not in a right relationship with God, you're missing out. You're missing out on that relationship that gives you the assurance that in times of spiritual warfare, there's a place for me to go. There's a place for me to get safe. Now, dear in spiritual warfare, God is our fortress. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I guess this is one of those verses that gets misquoted to me a lot. And if you've ever misquoted it to me, I didn't correct you. Because if you do misquote it, it's during a time where you're really struggling, suffering, loss of a loved one, some pain in your life, your children going astray, whatever it is. And we tend to quote this. And I won't correct you in your time of suffering, but allow me to teach the text. So that we can get the right idea about who God is. Verse 13. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you, this is the part, He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, He will also provide a way out so that you may be able to bear it. Now have you ever said, God won't put any more on you than you can handle. That's not in the Bible. God has given you a place of solitude, a fortress. He has given you a, a place of shelter. But you also are in a fallen creation where people make bad consequences and they make decisions, bad decisions that have consequences. And people would do things in this world with their sin natures that causes corruption and it trickles down onto you. We live in a world of cancer. We live in a world of death. We live in a world where it, heartbreak. You're not brought out of that. Until you're brought out of this world. And sometimes bad things happen to you to the point where you can't deal with it. It's more than you can handle. And then somebody says, well, God won't put any more on you than you can handle. And then you go, well, I must be able to handle a lot. I sure don't feel like it right now. And it's a misrepresentation of what God does and who God is. It's not fair to God for one. Truth is, this old rotten, stinking world puts stuff on you you can't handle. You don't know how to deal with it. You don't know how to get up the next morning. You don't know how to breathe. You don't know how to live. But your God will carry you through it. That's the promise. But what's this text about? It's really about spiritual warfare. Because the text is about temptation, not suffering. What is spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare ain't nothing but sin, folks. That's all it is. It's your battle with trying to live a holy, righteous life and not falling into temptation or into sin. Here's the thing about sin. This is what this text means. There is not a sin that you have not had a way of getting out and escaping from that sin. You and I are without excuse. 
This is what it says. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, He will also provide a way out. So when I sin, and I do, and when you sin, and you do, there was a way out. That way out was God. The spiritual warfare comes in because the, every rebellion, if you look through your Bible, every heavenly rebellion, every, you can say angelic, you can say heavenly host, whatever term you want to use, every rebellion in your Bible came down to one thing, sin. Sin. Usually selfishness being the main goal of the sin because of how we are. Sin. When you are even... Folks, if you don't believe that spiritual warfare and sin is a part of this, we are in Psalm 91. One of the interesting things about Psalm 91 is when the devil himself was tempting Jesus, he quoted Psalms 91, 11 through 12. Yes, I should have put it on the screen because everybody went there. It's the very verses... Satan was using the Word of God to try to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. Spiritual, it, the greatest illustration of spiritual warfare we have. So when you are in the midst of the battle, when you are in the midst of spiritual warfare, and we're not talking about suffering here. Because let me tell you something interesting about suffering. Suffering can have a purpose. We just don't like it. Suffering can be useful. We just don't want to suffer. And that's fine. I, hey, I said we. I don't want to either. I don't want to have to go through something that I can't handle. But I will. It's inevitable. Yeah, that bottle's half empty, right? It's inevitable that something in this world will come against you. But the assurance of knowing that in my relationship with Almighty God, I have a storm shelter I can go to, and I have a military fortress that I can go to and find my way into protection from temptation and from attack and from storms of life and all that. I can go to God. I can get in the shadow of the Father and be in His presence. Now the problem with sin is, when it does happen, I don't want to half the time. Let's be real. When we sin, it's because we wanted to sin. That's one of those big lies. You know, well, it's a mistake. No, it's not a mistake. It was a choice. But that's the battle. You say, well, I think spiritual warfare goes deeper than that. Yeah, but it always comes back to sin. Because, all right, say it's your family under attack. Your family, your children, everything. And... You go, man, the enemy has really come against my children and my children have gone astray. Yeah, it goes back to sin. Because if they weren't going off into sin, they wouldn't be going astray. It's always about sin. That's why it's dangerous if we don't preach on sin anymore and we don't want to hear sin preached on because that's a tactic of the enemy. If we can remove what spiritual warfare is out of the picture, then the battle's already lost. If we're not going to say it's sin... So, we got this safe retreat, if you choose to take it, that you can go to, and it's the secret place of the Most High. That, that's a beautiful image, the secret place, being in His shadow, all that stuff. So He's my refuge, He's my fortress. Then the psalmist says, In Him will I trust. The last part of verse 2. Going to trust in Him. What is trust? You know, to make it simple, we, we struggle sometimes with what faith means. Trust just means faith. Faith is trusting. You, you trusted that chair when you sat in it, that it would hold you up. And thankfully for you, it did. Because Marshall would have made fun of you if it hadn't, because he's a hateful person. I still haven't got over he made fun of my shirt. So you trusted in that seat. You trusted... In several things this morning, when you got up, got in your vehicle, when you ate the food your spouse cooked, you was trusting they didn't poison you this morning. You know, there's all kinds of ways we trust. 
That's what's going on here is this trust is trusting in Him. Now, Ephesians chapter 2. We all, all know it by heart because I use it every Sunday. For you are saved by grace through faith, trusting in Him. And Christ is not <clears throat> of yourselves. And this is not of yourself. It is God's gift. Verse 9. Not from work so that no one can boast. So there's nothing you can do. It's just you trusting in the one who can do it. I can trust in Jesus because I've examined. I didn't, I didn't grow up with a Christian mindset. I examined the cross. I examined the work He did. I examined His life. I examined, But then there was that resurrection, man. And when He had the power and the authority to be resurrected and have 500 eyewitnesses see Him and to ascend back and all that stuff. When you start really trying to understand it, I think, my goodness, I believe I can trust this guy. He must be God. So how else? And who else am I going to trust in? Because it's not from works so that no one can boast. I can't trust me. So who's my faith in? Jesus. And you've been justified that way. How can you be made right with God? Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous, by what? Faith, trusting God. Then we have peace with God. So who's the object of that faith? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, by declaring, by being declared righteous by God, because you have faith, in Jesus, in whom you can trust. That's the one you place this faith in, the God of the Bible. You're not going to find it anywhere else. I've looked. Some other religions and some other beliefs may have some good ideas, folks, but none of them give you that assurance. None of them give you that this is the way there's nobody but Jesus that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's either, like C.S. Lewis said, he's either a liar or a lunatic. We have to decide which one he is. For me, in my examining of his life, and the word, and the testimony, and those that early on saw him and laid down their lives for him, I can only conclude that he's the Lord. And if he is the Lord, then I need to trust him. And I'm not... Wearing rose-colored glasses to mean that nothing bad will ever happen. But when the bad stuff comes, I've got a shelter. When the bad stuff comes, I've got a place of refuge. I can be in His shadow. I have been given the right to be called a child of God. I can't do that in my own strength. So, do we dwell... In the secret place of the Most High. Have we found a hiding place? We tend to, and I know me, I know I will, we tend to do escapism to deal with whatever the bad is. And the problem is that we will go and we'll run to entertainment and we'll run to everything else to escape, to escape to get away from it, don't want to think about it, don't want to dwell on it. And we run to all this other stuff. And God wants us to run to Him. I'm telling you, a lot of times in my life, I haven't done it right. And I, I see this in the Bible, and I get convicted about it, and I just wonder, will I do it again? When really, the only place I can find rest, the only place is in the shadow of God. I can't get it anywhere else. How's that relationship working out for you? How are you doing when, the, when this stuff's happening? How are you dealing with it? Are you able, have you been going to the Lord? Have you been feeding the relationship, being in prayer, being in the Word, spending time with God? Is that what you're doing? Or do you say, you know what? I need to do better. I need to seek something more. I need to, since this world is so terrible, maybe I ought to really start understanding I need God in everything I do. I need Him 
It's not a Sunday thing. It's all the time. I need to be in that shelter and I need to be with Him and I'm not going to find peace until I do. And we can smile and we can shake hands or we used to could and we can act like everything's okay and we can go around and be glory hallelujah, bless your heart at church and get in the car and go home and be miserable. Or you can find refuge in God. Father, we thank You for Jesus. We pray, God, if anybody here has been struggling, struggling spiritually, emotionally, physically, I pray, God, they take this opportunity that we give to come to You and seek Your shelter, Your refuge. If You stand with us, please, in Jesus' name.